morning church. It's a rainy day today. And uh, thank God for the rains. Thank God, thank God. Good morning. Are you happy? Happy? I'm <laughs> Richard is smiling. Even though you're, you have your face mask on, I can see you're smiling. <laughs> okay. Thank God. You know, for the past week, we are talking about um, how to sustain you know, our joy, your joy, and um, by knowing what kills your joy. Okay. You know, by knowing what kills your joy, we are equipping ourselves with knowledge and wisdom to apply those knowledge so that we can kill what kills our joy. For the past weeks, we've been talking about happiness. We've been talking about joyfulness. Okay? And last week, we did talk about the poison of pride. Okay? Pride that kills our joy. And we talk about the antidote and uh, the antidote of humility. Right? So today, we will discuss another joy. Okay? Um, again, that's really close to my heart. Last week, we talked about pride. That's very close to my heart. Fried chicken. <laughs> and uh, today, um, we will talk about that's what really close to my heart because when I truly learned to apply this into my life, I found peace of mind. And it keeps those smiles on my face and joy in my heart. So today, we will talk about grumbling. We'll talk about grumbling. Grumbling kills your joy. Right? So grumbling, it means complaining. It means disputing, questioning, doubting. The word also means murmuring. Right? Do you know what murmuring is? <laughs> In reference to the Old Testament, that which was used of the murmurings of the Israelites during their wanderings. Now, the first question is, is grumbling a sin? Is it a sin? In Philippians chapter 2, part of the uh, scripture reading, Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, the Bible said, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a rough and crooked generation or crooked generation then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Now, just a quick flashback into the rich history of the Israelites. You know, the Israelites may have been the nation that mastered the art of murmuring, that mastered the art of grumbling. Now, remember, God rescued them from Pharaoh, from Egypt, from the slavery, and they grumbled to God. And then when God rescued them, from the pursuing armies of Pharaoh into that Red Sea, they grumbled. Okay? Now, when they became thirsty, there's no water to drink, they grumble again to God. So God provided sweet water to them. Then after a while, they grumbled again, for they are hungry. Exodus 16 and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You see, after God rescued them from the slavery in Egypt, they grumble. They grumble, they don't have water, and then food. So God provided them with manna, manna in the morning, and quail in the evening. And in the process of their grumbling, they made an idols. They made an idols to worship, and eventually some people. Now, if you're going to read Exodus, you're going to read Numbers, the book of Numbers, you will find the name Korah. Okay, Datam and Abiram. These people, okay, they banded together and with some other 250 others, uh, group leaders, they banded together and they wanted 
to topple the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And they grumbled against God. Okay. And then after that, okay, after which they died in the hands of God. Now, another group of people grumbled against the Lord in Numbers chapter 16, verse 41. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. And in verse 49, how many died? But 4,700 people died from the plague in addition to those who died because of Korah. You see, because of their grumbling, Korah, his two friends, and other 250 men, leaders, died. And when they died, 14,700 grumbled. And they died as well. As a result, you see, people died. Now, particularly in the Old Testament, when the consequence of your action is death, it means you've committed a sin against the Lord. Now, it is consistent with the principles of God spiritually that says the wages or for the wages of sin is death. Okay, that is particular in the Old Testament. Now, they say that grumbling is the humming voice of sin. Okay. Now, in grumbling, when pride comes into the picture, you know, people might say, you know, Brother Mike, you know, I'm just being honest. You know, Brother Mike, I'm just letting the steam out of my chest. You know, Brother Charles, it is just my opinion. Brother Derek, you know, it is just me telling God my prayer request in a grumbling kind of way. You know, but guess what? My dear brothers, sisters, and friends, you may call it anything you want. We may hide it in different words. Okay? You can sugarcoat it all you want. But here's the thing. God sees your heart. Sees your heart. Okay? Now, I want to believe that when Jesus started his ministry in that mountainside and started teaching about the famous Sermon on the Mount, he's teaching us first to take care of our hearts. Our hearts, our minds, and our motives. It is because what's in our heart, what's in our mind, are where the poison of sin starts. That's why the Sermon of the Mount is about the matters of the heart. If you will read the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 up to Matthew chapter 7, you can see that Jesus is teaching us to clean our hearts, to clean our minds, to clean our motives. Jesus' first agenda in his ministry is clean the inside. Clean your heart first. Clean your mind and clean your motive. He said, Who to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be righteous. I appear to be righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You see, that's why I want to believe again. Jesus started his ministry teaching us to clean our hearts, teaching us to clean our motives and our minds. Now, grumbling, it is the voice of discontentment. From the start, of the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt up to the promised land. You know, we have seen their grumblings. We have seen their complaints. We have seen their murmurings to God. They dispute against God. And one thing that they were consistent of is their grumblings. You see, grumblings see the neighbor's blessing. It does not see your own blessings. Grumbling are never satisfied. 
always lacking, and always wants more. Grumbling takes away the honor and glory that God deserves. It does not see the giver, which is God. All it sees is the wants, the needs, the satisfaction of the desire. God is nowhere in the horizon. It is blind. It does not see God in the picture. Grumbling, it is the voice of unbelief. Okay. Now, you see, we just don't trust God enough to stand by his word and take his word for it. The problem is, it is unfortunate because sometimes we take our fellow's word more seriously than we take God's, right? Now, what's the word of God? Now, Jesus himself said, the famous Matthew, okay, do not worry. Okay. I know you heard that every now and then. God said, do not worry, and yet we worry. Jesus said, do not worry. But grumbling says, worry. Okay. Now, let me ask you this, brethren. Who likes fish? Who likes fish? Oh, everybody likes fish. Okay. Now, here's the question. Have you ever run out of fish to eat? Now, who likes meat? Chicken, pork, beef, goat. Right. Same question. Have you ever run out of meat to eat? Who likes vegetable? I do. We all do. Have we ever run out of vegetables to eat? You know, at one point, at one point, I was in the Bay Area back home, looking at the sea, looking at my surroundings, and I was fascinated, and I was amazed by God. Because I tell myself, I never run out of fish to eat. When I go to McDonald's, when I go to Jollibee, I don't know, you, I don't know if some of you know Jollibee, probably Filipinos know Jollibee, fast food chain like, Mac, like McDonald's, I always have my fried chicken. They never run out of fried chicken. And I was thinking God. right? We never run out of food to eat. And no pun intended, while back home, when the pandemic hits us, 2020, we were watching back home. We were watching back home about here in the U.S. running out of tissue papers. And we were questioning, and I myself was wondering, what is between tissue paper in the U.S., the toilet paper in the U.S.? Not no pun intended, but, you know, we're thinking. You see, God said, do not worry. Do not worry. You see? God will supply everything that we need. He said that. He said that he will supply everything that you need. Why worry? Why worry about so many things? Why worry about the, the necessities of life? Okay. It is a command of God. It is a command of God not to worry about all things that are necessity in our life. And yet, again, grumbling says worry. As one Bible commentator said, Matthew Henry, I read one of his commentary. He said, God's command were given to be obeyed, not to be disputed. And that's correct. That is correct. We have to obey the command of the Lord when he said, do not worry. Okay. Now, my dear brethren and friends, and those that are watching us in the Zoom, and who will watch this in the social media, now I want you to listen to this. 
I want you to listen to this very carefully. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, a very meaningful verse in the Bible. Apostle Paul said, He pertaining to God, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for, for us all, how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all? Did we get that? Did we get what Apostle Paul said? Did we get what the Bible said? How will you dispute God and grumble in his face when his own son, he did not spare? To give you what? To give you hope of eternal life in heaven. Now, if you are a true believer of God, you will not grumble. You will not dispute nor worry. You know, just do what you have to do. And God, and let God do his way. And remember that. God did not spare his own son. Now grumbling, it feeds on doubt instead of trust. It is the voice of lies. Grumbling is the voice of lies. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 13, Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, nowhere in the Bible okay, that God tells us that we will not be sick. Nowhere in the Bible that God tells us that we will not have any pain in this world. Nowhere in the Bible that God tells us that we will not have trials or temptations in this world, right? Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible. But when we are going through tough times, unfortunately, sometimes we blame God. Sometimes we confront God, dispute God. We complain so-and-so. Lord, I'm so faithful. Why this happened to me? Lord, why me? Lord, why us, but not them? Lord, why me, not him? See, we complain about God. Oh, we complain to God. We complain about so many things. You know, and all others are complaining to God. You see, unfortunately, even Christians, we fall into the sin of grumbling. Okay? And when unbelievers see you complaining, when an unbeliever see you grumbling, See you unhappy. See you miserable. They have now more reasons not to trust God. They have now more reasons not to believe God. Because you yourself, Christians that we are, we look miserable. We always complain about things. We always grumble about things. How can we convince the people that surround us to believe in God, where ourselves, we don't trust in his word. Okay. Grumbling, it relies on false doctrine rather than the truth. You see, grumbling relies on the, in, the, the false interpretation of reality. Okay. Just like what happened to Adam and Eve. The verse that we read a while ago. The reality is, God said, to them, okay, do not eat nor touch the fruit or you will die. That's the reality. But the devil, when he came into the picture, said to Eve, you will not die. And in fact, you will become like God. Okay. Now, here's the reality. Here's the reality, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends. Jesus himself said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrow. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Brethren and friends, that is the reality. You will have sorrow. You will have trials. Whether you be a Christian or not, you will have this in life. Who among you 
never experienced pain. Anybody? None. Who amongst us never experienced sorrow? None. Who amongst us never experienced sadness? None. So therefore, Christ is right. He is always right. He is always right. And then here we are. We grumble. We complain about so many things. Okay. As Christians that we are, we need to reinforce. We need to re-educate ourselves with the truth of God's word and with the truth of God's promises so that life's circumstances will not diminish your faith. We need to reinforce ourselves. We need to refill ourselves with the truth. That's why you and I, we need to read our Bible every day as we grow, grow, grow. Have we not sang that to our children? Read your Bible and pray every day. Pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day as you grow, 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 as you grow, grow, grow. You see, we should never stop reading our Bible. Learning never stops. Learning never stops. Now, here's another truth. Here's another truth. Proverbs 37, 25, and Proverbs chapter 10, 3. Most of uh, Moses, um, David said, I was young, and now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken on their children begging bread. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. I was young. And now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous go hungry or forsaken, their children begging for food. That is the truth. If you are righteous, God said, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. Amen to that. Amen. You know what? I've been holding on to these verses all my life. Until now, God is righteous. God is gracious. He never let the righteous go hungry. If you are a true Christian, you will hang on to these verses. This is another truth that we need to reinforce ourselves. I am a living testament to this. I am a living testament to this. I have told this to my wife. I have told this to my kids over and over again. You know, when pandemic, let me tell you my story very briefly. When pandemic hits us in the year 2020, from March to December, lockdown. I believe it's the same here. So lockdown. All the business were closed, except for those uh, like in, in the hospital or Drug stores, you know, the necessities. And back home, March to December, I have no sales. Okay? No income coming in. Expenses going out. Okay? I have my receivables. My clients, they're close. I cannot collect because they are close. And my receivables became bad debts. I cannot collect anymore. So for those times, we have nothing. We have nothing. But you see, I try to look for ways. I try to look for ways to earn and survive. And glory to God, he showed me the way. Glory to God, he gave me wisdom. He gave me wisdom. And let, I just want to show you some of the pictures. Okay. I made those things. Those are hand sanitation stations where you put your foot here and it will dispense or disperse the liquid, the alcohol. And then after which, when everybody's doing that, I switched to this. I started selling 
thermal scanner. I started selling solutions, disinfecting solutions. And then when everybody's doing that, I started to disinfect churches. I started to disinfect banks. I started to disinfect offices. And when everybody is doing that, I started cleaning shoes, <laughs> repairing shoes. Okay? Now, why am I telling you this? Why am I showing you this? Well, it is not to put myself in the spotlight. No, no, no. I want you to see God. I want you to see God in the midst of your trials. I want you to see God in the midst of your trials and praise Him. Okay? I want you to see that we have a generous God. I want you to see that we have a righteous God. I want you to see that we have a God full of mercy and full of grace. You know, I'm telling you this, I'm showing you this because I am a living testament of Proverbs 37 10. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 3. I know the Lord, He will not let me and my family go hungry. See? I hold on to those words. In the midst of the pandemic, you see, it's a, a very trying time for all of us, for all of you. Okay? You know, future unknown. We don't know. You know what? I did not grumble. I did not complain to God. I did not complain. I did not murmur. What I did, I talked to God in prayer. I talked to God in prayer, gave Him my cares, gave him my thoughts, gave him my insight, and asked for directions which way to go. And I just do what I have to do. You just do what you have to do. And let God do the rest. Just hang on to your faith. Just hang on to your faith. I did not just sit down, be lazy, and wait for the blessings to pour. No. God sustained me and my family as he did to you. Look at you now. We all survive, right? We all survive. God gave everything, me and my family, whatever we need. God gave everything to us. And we were still able to do what we love most, doing our outreach ministry back home. Now, when I look back two and a half years ago, I always see an awesome God. When I look back, I always see a loving, compassionate God who always true to his words. Looking back at those times, it's always been God. Looking back at those times, I am grateful that I have God. Now, speaking of which, the vaccine to kill joy is to live a Christ-centered life that is full of gratitude. You live a Christ-centered life that is full of gratitude in order for you to kill the poison of grumbling. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. See, you should always give thanks to God for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Short story, I remember these two friends. After a long and tiring day in the farm, in the field, they went over to a plum tree. They rested under the plum tree. And then in the, in the midst of their, you know, where they were sleeping, all of a sudden, one plum, plum fruit fell onto Peter. Let's call him Peter. And then he was awakened. And when he was about to sleep, another fell Onto his head. And then he was grumbling. He was complaining. And beside him is John. And John was awakened to the grumbling of Peter. And John asked him, Why are you complaining? Why are you grumbling? You know, because of this fruit, this plum tree, you know, the fruit fell on my head. I was sleeping and now I'm awake. I can't sleep anymore. And then John said, Don't complain. What do you mean, don't complain? Don't complain. You know why? What if? You must be thankful. Thankful for what? For waking me up and I, and I cannot sleep anymore? And then John said, be thankful. What if? Think about this. What if God made the fruit of the plum bigger than the coconut? You'll be dead. 
you'll be dead. And it was like, oh, yeah, you're right. You see? Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you. God's will for you is to be thankful. Right? God's will for you is to be joyful. Who belong to Christ Jesus. Another story. Another story. A brother of Christ, a brother in Christ, recently shared me this story. You know how he was complaining about his, he, complaining about his hands. You know, his hands were hurting, his wrist, his carpals, you know, because of work related. Okay. Then his mindset was changed from complaining to gratitude. Why? When he saw his colleague, doing the same thing that he was doing and even doing more than him because his colleague just have only one arm. Okay. The other arm was prosthesis. He was like, oh God, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining anymore. I'm good with my hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can handle this. You see, I keep on complaining. I have no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. Mm. See, we could have been complaining. We could, like today, year end. Oh, I have to buy me new shoes. I have to buy me new suit. I have to buy me new dress. See, when you don't have new shoes, you keep on complaining. I don't have new set of suit today. I don't have new, no new set of shoes today. See? I keep on complaining until I saw a man who had no feet. You see, gratitude, it sees the beauty in life. Gratitude sees the beauty in life. Gratitude sees the blessing in life. Gratitude gives honor and glory to God. Now, learning this, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, it changed my perspective in life. I never complain. I always smile. I have peace in life. I always look at the bright side because God is there. See, I never complain. Our testimony as a children of God is marked not by grumbling and disputing, but by sincere gratefulness in the midst of adversities because our joy is in the Lord. The famous Billy Graham once said, be grateful and you won't grumble. Grumble and you won't be grateful. That is true. That is true. My dear brothers and sisters, instead of grumbling, instead of complaining, instead of murmuring, instead of disputing. Why not follow what Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, when he said, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your requests known to God. Why not come to God in prayer? Why not come to God and ask Him for wisdom instead of complaining? We have so many things to thank God for than to complain. Every morning when you wake up, do you complain? Or do you thank God for another fresh of air? Or do you thank God for another life? You see, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, I want you to, to think about this. Can you tell your, the person beside you, be grateful? Can you tell the person beside you, Brother Charles, be grateful? Be grateful. Be grateful, Brother Ed, be grateful. Be grateful. See? Again, can you tell the person beside you, be joyful? Brother Charles, be joyful. Brother Ed. Be joyful. Be joyful. You see, 
Brothers, sisters, and friends, if anyone amongst you here that needs prayer, I encourage you, please come forward. If you have, if life is hard on you, please come forward. We'll pray for you and feel the peace of God. If you feel like giving up in life, I want you to think that there's God. You have us. You have your brothers, your sisters in this congregation to help you. Why not come today and accept the Lord? If you have not yet accepted the Lord, come today. Come forward. Accept the Lord. Accept Him in your life. Baptize into His name. And secure a place in heaven. Come forward. If anything there is that you want to just you know, pray for you, your family, your friends, you're having a, a, a tough, uh, tough day in work, come forward. Let the elders pray for you. Let us pray for you. Let us pray for you. Our hope that we will feel the gratitude in our hearts every day when you wake up. Instead of grumbling, think about what God did to you. Think about what Jesus did to you on the cross. Remember, God did not spare his own son. So why do we grumble about small things? Why do we grumble about what to eat when God himself did not spare his own son for you and I? On the cross. Now, while waiting for someone, while waiting for you to come forward, can ask the congregation to stand up as we sing the song of invitation.